Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Please be seated. Please be seated for the next panel. The title of the next panel is Sovereignty, Security, and a Thriving Society. And uh, we have the pleasure of uh, having as a moderator for this panel, uh, a chairman for uh, a local um, chapter of the Finns Party Youth, Samuel Rapinoja Di Carvalho. Welcome to the stage. Uh, yes, thank you everyone uh, for attending. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, I know you're keen on hearing the speakers, so I will keep my portion very short. Uh, but first, I would like the speakers to, to come on stage so that I'm not introducing you when everybody sees only the back of your head. So please, uh, Anna Mulberry, uh, Christian Anton, uh, Smidge Haug, and, uh, and Mahmoud Farmad, please uh, come up on stage. And please, everyone, applaud. Please, uh, come on. Yeah, so Anna is the, you're on the back side, and then, and uh, Mahmoud uh, closer to me, and then Christian Anton here in the center. Yes. Uh, yes, so this panel is uh, sovereignty, security, and a thriving society. And uh, partially, I think, uh, the job of ideologues like ourselves, conservative ideologues like ourselves, is the game of definitions and defining what the terms mean of which we speak. And so uh, sovereignty being something that I think conservatives, especially uh, in Europe, because of the EU, uh, is something that we're focused on. The ability to govern ourselves and make sure that the decisions that are made in society are made by elected officials that are like us and that understand us, rather than nameless, faceless bureaucrats somewhere out in Europe. Uh, but sovereignty also has a national aspect that, like I said, it's not only that we've directly elected officials, but this national aspect of of being governed by people who are like us and understand us, uh, not only in proximity, but in culture as well. Security can mean a lot of things as well, and this is why in this panel we're also defining security somehow, be it uh, food security and being aware of uh, being ready for crises, uh, but also national security, obviously with the past year and uh, Russian conflicts, which I don't think surprised any Finns, or any clever Europeans, we've all understood what kind of nation Russia is, but it really became clear in the last year. But there are other security issues, uh, internal and external, uh, be that Islamic terror, et cetera, et cetera, or uh, food security and being uh, ready for crises. Also, the third, I think, is the most vague term, a thriving society. What means a society is thriving? Uh, what are the metrics we use? And what are the prerequisites for a society to succeed and thrive. So I hope uh, this will be a very uh, enriching discussion about these three topics. And so uh, our, our first speaker, Anna Molberg, is a, a conservative Norwegian politician uh, who is a parliamentarian uh, for the Conservative Party, a lawyer, and has also been previously an advisor for the parliament, and is the chairman of New Norsk Kulturpris, which is the new Norwegian Culture Prize, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, Christian Anton Smidhaug or Smidhaug? Smidhaug uh, is the uh, manager of Agri Analyze, which is a research company focusing on issues related to agriculture and politics. A PhD in ecology from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, where he also lectures as associate professor. He's also written numerous books related to agriculture political economy and politics, and he's a member of the EEA committee. And Mahmoud, who probably wouldn't need a second introduction, but for the uh, topic of, of this panel, uh, he has a two-decade expertise in security from his military background uh, with uh, security threat analysis and uh, analyzing countries and, uh, and foreign affairs. So please welcome Anna with thunderous applause as our first speaker.
Thank you very much for a lovely introduction. Dear friends, dear colleagues, you couldn't have chosen a better venue for this conference than in Helsinki. Finland has just joined the other 30 capitals of Europe uh, and North America in the NATO alliance. And here we are. Let me uh, add right away my sincerest wish that Sweden's accession will be swift too. NATO needs a strong Nordic bloc and the Nordic countries need to be able to participate wherever we can. No one should doubt the historical and cultural bonds between us, Scandinavian neighbours. But our security does not rest on bonds alone. We need formal alliances for our security. And why NATO? Because NATO is based on something deeper between like-minded nations. It's not an alliance of convenience. It also expresses the deep affinity between different countries. And Finland and Sweden's NATO applications are direct consequences of Russia's attack on Ukraine. The same is true for the rally around the course between Western countries and EU. That is not to say that we can trust that the newly discovered attraction will last or that we can take it for granted. Far from it. If there's something history has taught us, it is that Europe is, a, is really good at finding a way to drift apart over minor disagreements. We are good at what Sigmund Freud called the narcissism of minor differences. Hence the importance of conferences like this. And the most important thing of learning from the war in Ukraine, to me, is the following. You can be victorious if you have American and Western weaponry and Ukrainian will to fight. The Western cohesion rests on our ability to keep supporting Ukraine. But what about our own traditions and values? We have a strong cultural infrastructure. But are we willing to maintain it? Do we care enough about it? In the Iliad, we read about Nestor advising Agamemnon to divide his troops according to families. The men would fight more eagerly if they fought for the survival of their brothers and cousins. This is the eternal lesson from war and from the ongoing war in Ukraine. You need something to care about. The Ukrainians definitely do, and they fight for their freedom. In an interview some years ago, the late Roger Scruton described conservatism as the ability to care for something and the desire to protect it. The same applies in our culture. We have Western advanced economies, technology, democracy, and impressive art and music. But do we believe in the value of our culture? What I'm trying to say is that I'm wondering if we have the required trust in our culture to stand up for it and advance it. I'm not saying that we are threatened by some imminent crisis or anything, but perhaps maybe a gradual undermining of values like freedom of speech and freedom of conscience. We are, for example, always ransacking our vocabulary to find non-offensive terminology. We don't always dare to speak our minds anymore. Roald Dahl's books are scrutinized for political incorrectness. J.K. Rowling spoke her mind about genders. Now, the Harry Potter actors refuse to share a stage with her. Never mind that they all owe their careers to her authorship. In our culture, we always talk about freedom and that we value it. But what is freedom these days? Where do we see it today? It is common in political philosophy to separate positive freedom from negative freedom. It could also be termed freedom to and freedom from. All Western democracies today have large state bureaucracies, developed welfare states and social programs. The era of the Nightwatcher state is long gone. 
Is the division between positive and negative freedom of any use? I think the answer to that is yes. Furthermore, I think it's of use to the topic we are uh, asked to address today. And let me briefly provide my reasons for saying so. Every politician in the West today claims to be on the side of freedom. Most political standpoints are justified with reference to this one concept. Hence, we need to distinguish between the different kinds of freedoms. Traditionally, there has been a left-right distinction between the two forms of freedom. The conservative side has been preoccupied with negative freedom, the freedom from this and that, high taxes, state control and regulations. The socialist side has been keen to further an agenda of positive freedom. The wish list for new rights and regulations is always long. And uh, as an MP from one of the largest we welfare states in the world, I feel this list will never come to an end. It's going to boost our inflation through the roof. And the result? People lose economic freedom more and more. 80% of Norwegians own their debt finance houses. And the mortgage rates are increasing every month right now. My generation is not used to this at all. We are used to 2% mortgage rates, not 5 or 6. Over time, the distinction between the types of freedom has blurred. Conservative parties has also contributed to this. I'm sure many here today feel that the right has lost its way. And that's uh, partially attributable to the fact that we too increase government spending from time to time. For better or worse, the Nordic uh, welfare states provides us with a safety net we all consider necessary to some extent. It gives us freedom from economic ruin when we get old or if we get sick or injured. But for conservative politicians, it also gives us reasons to worry about how to finance it for future generations. Because in Norway, our safety net just keeps expanding. Admittedly, we do have a gigantic oil fund, but I can assure you that this is not big enough to cover our welfare costs if we don't reduce them. To conclude, I think it's time for conservatives to reclaim the notion of freedom. We are against oppression, whether it be lawful military aggression broadly or various attempts to, to curb freedom of thought and expression. We also need to always think twice before we introduce new regulations, increased public spending and more taxes. This is a huge debate in Norway at the moment because we experience a leftist government whose taxation policy and invasive legislation for businesses is pushing them to move out of our country in favor of Switzerland. We have seen that the West can succeed and prosper, but perhaps we must rediscover the foundations of our culture again. A clear concept of freedom is a place to start. Secondly, I think freedom also means economic integration, especially between NATO allies. The West is and should remain to be our primary home base, both economically and regards to security. No man is an island. That applies to countries as well, I think. But most importantly, freedom means to avoid falling for various socialist ideas. As Karl Popper famously said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for uh, inviting me to the lovely country of uh, Finland in the, these uh, special times for our Nordic countries and for Europe as a whole, as was uh, very good presented by uh, Anna here. A and uh, I will try to reflect upon the, so we say, relatively broad scaled uh, theme of our, um, of our session here. 
uh, something is based on uh, some books and first unfortunately only in the Norwegian there's also an English one which is on, on agriculture and, uh, and, <coughs> and global supply and demand um, so that will be for some other time but uh, now I think we are related to the s basics as uh, uh, in my view are the two defining issues so uh, oh my work on this, and this is from Nikos Davi Davila, and my friends here on the panel don't see it, but it's violence is not necessary to destroy a civilization. Each civilization dies from indifferent towards the unique values which created it. So we need to know where we are from, how to develop the unique history of, uh, of a civilization, but also of a different nation states, which are relatively different in a European context as well, even if we cooperate, but how to cooperate is the big issue. And the state is the most valuable of all human achievements and no effort is enough to make it capable of functioning in the best possible way. And that's why we're also discussing how do we make it function in the best possible way. That's the real big issue and the, the state cannot be ignored, it, it must be adapted and it must be used sustainable. And then, uh, then we go on and with the European civilization, with different cultural areas, we had the Protestant Northwest, you see, uh, including parts of Balticum, that we see Estian uh, and Latvia and Latonia is going into the more Catholic camp. And uh, then we have the Orthodox Christianity, Catholic Christianity and, and some parts of, of the Muslim world. And that means that Europe is a kind of defining civilization. At the same time, it has relatively big internal differences, which has to be handled if you really shall take the conservative and the value and tradition based uh, policies um, seriously. And, <coughs> and that gives rise to different kinds of conservatives as well. And it's, e it's relatively easily. Uh, put out like Christian Democrats, which is more continental, maybe more Catholic. You have conservative parties in Norway, like you have here, and also in the Nordic far party countries, you also have, also have traditional farmers' parties. It's not so uh, much used in, uh, in, in continental Europe. And then we have more market liberal parties, like the Anglo-Saxon, more like maybe attached to the Reformed Church. And now, in the last 20, 30 years, we have the right-wing populists, which we have more or less all over related to the national situation. And as uh, we see, we see it in parts of Denmark and we see it in parts of Norway historically, that you have some kind of conservative social democrats, where you have some splitted part of that, that movement too. It means that I the basic is it's a relatively big potential for uh, getting support. It's relatively broad scale and it is in, in different countries you have a relatively large basis potentially. But there are also the challenges between uh, Burke's conservatism versus Hayek's economic liberalism, which is also mentioned in the Nostos uh, conference um, pamphlet, which I think is important. And uh, you have the cultural liberalis liberalism and the individualism that follows it, and which in many cases could be opposed to conservative values, uh, especially related to traditional uh, and, and Christianity. So there are challenges also on, on this side and how to handle and balance these two uh, economic liberalism and the cultural liberalism that could be in, uh, in contrast to the classical conservative thinking, which I think we will discuss more in the next panel, but these are the basics that we have to handle. And I think John Hertz in, in 1950 and, and also in 1951 was writing about politi political realism versus political idealism and, and the challenge with liberalism that has no outside uh, enemy and then swells towards uh, victory if and it's attained victory and when it goes uh, onto its own society then you can get really liberalism in excess. And can unchecked liberalism destroy the fabric that society relies upon? I, is, I, is, uh, is that one of what we are now, in a way, a part of what we are approaching when we see the challenges for family, state, faith, cultural norms and traditions? And 
this uh, is also part of our ideological uh, way of behaving and what we should uh, manage to discuss and handle. But in my view, I think what we see is that the conservatives uh, is a kind of freedom and order. I've taken that from an uh, earlier conservative MP in Norway, this uh, Lars Ruhr Langslet. This was maybe was the uh, was a def defining uh, conservative thinker some uh, a generation ago. And uh, freedom and order, I think, is a relatively good sum up. And uh, in my view, a realistic national and economic policy based on values that have and will build society in the future. It's no utopism. And every nation and country have its own history, culture, and tradition. And this must be handled together with the challenge of having a reasonable cooperation. Um, and if you add on that to uh, a kind of scientific thinking and the basic thesis in, in um, science is that you should not change anything if you're not sure it will be better. The one who is changed, th the changer has to make good. That is, it's most likely that the change will do something better. Now we often have the situation where the one who is opposing the change has to make sure that the opposition is the real thing. So th there is no, the conservatism, which was the basic of science, is in a way reversed. So the one who are against the change have actually to make the, the claim that it is wrong. And that is, uh, I think, a kind of reversal of known uh, historical uh, knowledge. So what I believe get a thriving society is we must have balance versus extreme solutions. We all must have freedom versus a big state. We must have evolution and not revolution. We reform to sustain. Uh, that's of course important, but it's a kind of evolutionary process. And we have entrepreneurship versus regulation. And as uh, just mentioned, we have so much regulation now and we're really seeing that it's challenging for industry not just in Norway but in Europe in general losing a little to uh, US losing a little to to, to the <coughs> Gulf area and we are losing to Singapore and, and parts of, of China and we have the discussion between nation versus union but we have a positive view of the future and I think that is important in uh, a time where everything is uh, questioned and people are well, at, at least a lot of them are feeling relatively depressed. <coughs> we have had some challenges. Uh, I will not uh, go uh, thoroughly through them. And there are, as you know, relatively big opposition has been. And I think the Merkel versus Orban is the, the hi historical one was defined over the last decennium. But the nation states had to have to solve what the union uh, could not. And looking to Finland, this was one of the few countries that was really prepared when things happened, both military and with their uh, Forsøgingsberedskapscentral and keeping up the traditional historical and, um, uh, and the traditions and what was the experience-based solutions that the state kept even when uh, you had the fall of the Berlin War, the Finnish were keeping their uh, institutions and now everyone wants them back and I think that is uh, something that the Finns can be very proud of and, uh, and I guess they are. <coughs> and when we come down then to the, to the Nordic countries which was early kingdoms and old nations, relatively large homogeneity, we have the family farming, we have the state church and the Lutheran uh, Protestantism, it's a relatively unique construction <laughs> in, the, in the Western world uh, with the with state uh, with the with the state church that uh, really made the state so large and so efficient. So when the social democracy overtook it in the uh, just before and after the Second World War, it was made of values and a system that they really didn't uh, really didn't uh, I would say uh, took very seriously. So so in a way that they. Uh, these have been broken down over generations. The, the efficient state that was built on values made before uh, the social democracy overtook it. And I think that is n not very well understood. And <coughs> I think Lars Tregård has, has, has put it relatively um, 
relatively well that you have some kind of state individualism. We have a strong state giving, true the welfare state, giving lots of opportunities. And that means that we can be lovers of freedom and still have a relatively efficient state serving the people. And that means that the welfare state, it should be reasonably limited and not too big, but it should give room for individual freedom that in a way has created this state individualism and that, that is where we start from. So no, where are we now? I think we are uh, in a situation where we have a system of thoughts in which time has come. There are some verse versus any verse, which I think is put very well. And we are the some verse, I guess. And we see at the lack of trust, we see the lack of trust in ideologies and, and in globalism. And we see the lack loss of support for established uh, parties. And that means that I think the conservative thoughts and the historical based um, system that we rely upon has has come uh, has had it has no has it time and as dr do mr norrell rubini said just after the um, the financial crisis we uh, know that the laissez-faire of the anglo-saxon model has uh, so way failed the voodoo economics of the continental european model of deficit driven welfare states have failed so we need something new and uh, <coughs> Behind me here, I have uh, Mr. Ronald Reagan, and the last arrival. It was freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise, and I just reread his formal address to the nation, which I think very well can be reread. And as he said, what was actually the great revival was a rediscovery of our values and our common sense. And that was coming out from the 60s with the culture wars and the depression in the 1970s, and then. As I discussed with Hannes, he gave some kind of political entrepreneurship that really made the West great again, in a way. I, by the proven values and by both the values, but also on an economic policy. So you cannot manage this just on the values. You have to have a reasonable economic policy. It's also about bread and butter, which we now see with the inflation situation. So you, you must handle this economic and the value-based thing in the same way, and, most, and it must answer both of them. So uh, that, I believe, could be some part of uh, to look back, not because you can just, oh, we can take that playbook, but we can be inspired and see what functioned, what did not function, what is uh, for today, what was yesterday. Uh, and Reagan was also inspired by, uh, especially Franklin D. Roosevelt, and part of the New Deal. I know I shall soon stop. <laughs> and uh, I, I just found this one. This is the century of the common man. Uh, that was a speech that was given to every soldier during the Second World War. And this is the Norwegian one. It was given so we can have it in the, uh, in, in the pocket while fighting. And reread the idea of freedom through the New Deal, which was what you were fighting for during the 19, uh, early 1940s. And that was also what inspired part of, of Reagan's institution, the, the values and the Franklin D. Roosevelt and the, the freedom-loving people march as the SSA. And democracy is the only true political expression of Christianity that Mr. Wallace said, and he was the vice president of, of Franklin D. Roosevelt. So <coughs> I should not follow up on that one. We can put it out afterwards as well. So I've just ended here. I think it is about how to handle a nation, how to get the economic balance, how to have to reinvent the liberty and the traditions. I think the goal uh, put much right here in the in the left part as a kind of a Europe of nations, and I think the, um, the slogan of the order liberalism and uh, after uh, <coughs> and the Wirtschaftswunder of Germany, so much market as possible, so much state as necessary, is relatively reasonable. And then we can find a balanced, adaptable, real-world experience based on the conservative system of thoughts, as I prefer to call it, because I think ideology is not that clear-cut, but the conservatism is adapted to the local uh, nations in addition to having a lot in common. Thank you. Um, I'll keep it a, a bit shorter. Um, my, my focus will be on the, uh, uh, to, to put it in military terms, the, the willingness to use violence, as we call it. Uh, values are good. 
the belief in religion is good, the belief in a free society is good. But the willingness to use organized violence to protect these values are, are, are critical. That is something the West had forgotten. I remember my, my years back in the early 2000s at the Norwegian Army Academy. One of our main focuses within geopolitics was codependence. As long as countries do trade with each other, there will be no wars, we were told. I, being the, um, the rebel that I am, objected with, with consequences that it had for me. The grades weren't top that time, <laughs> to put it mildly. But, but the fact was, at that time when I objected, it was, it was a pretty, pretty basic thing, as I mentioned here. H having, ha not be believing, or believing that everyone shares the same values globally is, is, is a myth. But believing that we have some certain values, some, some, some for certain um, aspects on how the world should be run, and being willing to use organized violence to protect them is essential. And we see that in, in, in how the West, or how we in the Western world, have, has, have approached uh, the rest of the world. We have um, talked, spoken softly. We have, over time, built down our, our armed forces. Um, with the consequence that when the war in Ukraine came along, we were not prepared for it. Our intelligence services, to a certain degree, were not able to gauge what was going on there. And that's also a result of something else. Um, Huntington, Hunting, Samuel Huntington has said that the, the armed forces need to be a conservative uh, institution within a democracy, and I do agree. Just to give you a concrete example, in order to build up muscle memory to, a, to do a simple movement, it takes about 1,000 to 1,500 repetitions. To change that, you have to first de-learn it and then do 1,500 repetitions to learn it. That in itself takes a lot of time. Taking that from an individual level and bringing that up to a, a, a armed forces level, changing an armed force from one uh, focus to another takes decades, takes a lot of time. That's what we did. We rebuilt our armed forces with focus to fighting small wars with, 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 with tribal uh, opponents across the world. That has also the effect that now that we are, we are going into a kind of a Cold War state, we are not all that prepared. It would take us decades to get there. So for all, me as a politician, when we are talking about rebuilding or, or, or refocusing our armed forces in Norway or anywhere else, I'm quite uh, clear on, on one point. This will take time. And, no, and, and as my colleague Anna mentioned, no armed force is worth more than the population's willingness to fight for some values. All the arms or the tanks or the planes in the world will not solve anything, but the willingness to stand behind these values are, are, are the core, core, core thing. Um, I will t refer to Samuel Huntington, t t Huntington again, uh, and something that he wrote in the book from the 1960s, that is, I think, uh, The Soldier and the State. The soldier is the army. No army is better than its soldiers. The soldier is also a citizen. In fact, the highest obligation and privilege of the citizen is that of bearing arms for one's country. He elaborates on that, uh, on that point, country, in the book, and he elaborates again on, on the point of what values are we there to protect. Um, I, will, I will also point, point to, a, to, a, to a, another very uh, po popular way of putting this. It's, it's quite good to speak softly, but you have to be willing to carry a big stick to back up your soft words. Without that, there will be no sovereign states. And without the ab ability to provide for your people the safety that they need, they will end up choosing something else. A true example of that we see in a country such as South Africa. A few years ago, South Africa was part of the BRICS uh, countries, as all, we all know of. Right now, South Africa is, is, a, is a huge mess because the tr people's trust in the government and the politicians to provide safety and security for them is, 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 is gone, basically. Um, I will leave it at that, uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Yes, I think jumping off from, from uh, the last speech here, uh, let's jump into the topic of security. Uh, my question might be a bit broad, but uh, bear with me. 
what do you believe, uh, for all the panelists here, is the biggest or primary threat to security for Nordic countries? Uh, do you really believe um, military threats are the primary threat? Is it our food security or, uh, you know, unpreparedness for crisis? Uh, you know, is it global markets with information technology, Chinese espionage, etc.? Uh, what do you think is the primary focus, or what is an area that we lack focus on when it comes to national security? I could, I could probably give it a go. Um, I, I think that the, 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 there is no contrast here. We, we having a, a army, a, str a strong deterrent army, is, is center of this. But one thing that we do not, or we have started to speak more about it after the war in Ukraine began. But before that, we had so-called value chains. The, the chains that we depend on metals, uh, energy, so what be it, to keep up the s structure of society. Germany had a had an interesting experience because of the war. They're, they're dependent on Russian Russian energy didn't pay off, and that brings me to 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 a point that we as humans have a we are not able to learn from history because what Germany experienced if, last year is something the West experienced during the seventies. But led to the to the energy crisis of the 70s with Iran and Saudi Arabia closing off the 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 the, the oil supplies, that led to the inflation of, of the 80s and so on. So history repeats itself, and we are not able to learn that being dependent on autocracies is not the way to go ahead. So so value chains and, and dependence on metals and energy is, is, is something that we need to get a lot more focus on. Yes, uh, Christian Anton, and then we'll have Anna. <clears throat> yeah, I want to follow up on uh, Mahmoud here because I think it's it's a very um, I, I think what what the 2020s really seems to be about is about industrial value chain and the future of production. And when you look at uh, at the US, which has this uh, Inflation Reduction Act on the 370 billion US dollar, and then they have this Ship Act, which is about the same size. And everything goes, so who will have the technology for the future? And who will have the value chain with the, from, uh, from metals to energy? And how do you really operate uh, this? And that means that in a way you are going back to before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because then you were trading with what we know called friend shoring. You were trading with <laughs> friends. And you had a home shoring where you produced what you really needed at home or you had different kind of uh, agreements with your uh, loyal friends. And if you were not sure of that, then you had storage in addition. You have grain storage, you had medicines, you have uh, medical equipment like the, the Finns had uh, when the COVID um, came. Uh, they may have uh, stored it a little too long possibly, but, <laughs> but, but even though if they really had done this work uh, properly in all of the countries, we didn't have, it, we had wouldn't have needed the real big economic and trust loss that actually happened in uh, afterwards the, the the corona situation so i think the value chain and preparedness is is the two big thing because the two big thing that actually has uh, <laughs> taken us aback in the last two years that will be the disease situation and it will be the invasion in ukraine we were not prepared for anything it means it's very hard to be prepared, but it's relatively easy to know what you will need in an emergency situation. So I think you must go the other way around and s start to look for preparedness, look for agreements, and you must have a really good economic and techno uh, technological policy. Because th th my last point here is that if, if you are not on the train now leaving with the semiconductors and the really advanced industrial policy, it's very hard to join it. And that's Europe's big challenge, especially, for example, with, with Africa, because the difference between an industrial country now and an industrial country 30 years ago is that 30 years ago, you could still industrialize with cheap hands, like China did. Now it's very hard to industrialize with cheap hands. If you're losing out on a technological train, you are losing out on welfare in the long run. And I think that's a real big challenge. Yeah, well, you asked what our biggest threat is today, and I would, I would say it's a mix between uh, different topics. But of course, the military threat is, is really there right now. And 
And I think we need to discuss more uh, how we finance our um, military. Uh, I think uh, the military now in NATO and especially in Norway, it's a pu pure question of uh, uh, ins insufficient investments in, in our military. And uh, I think the, the war, and I really hope that the war in Ukraine has uh, contributed to uh, to change our minds about how we spend money on the military and the army. And uh, does Europe need to step up militarily and the finances? Yes, of course, absolutely. And, and do we need to take better care of our security? I think yes. Uh, and we need to build defense capabilities, and, uh, but also at the same time imbue our citizens with the will uh, to defend ourselves and the will to fight uh, if it should be required. And, uh, as in Norway right now, we just uh, received a report from this uh, government, uh, governmental defense commission, uh, which presented uh, an assessment uh, of our military posture, and it argued in essence that uh, our defense budgets should be doubled at least. So that's the situation we are uh, in, in Norway right now, and uh, I think that applies also for, for the rest of the NATO alliance as well. Uh, I, I just... Uh, I while Christian was talking, I came to uh, referring back to the first panel we had here. One of our main issues is one thing is access to energy and, and metals. Another thing is the labor force. I mean, that, that's, that's the scarcity that we have in the entire Western world. Even China is going into a huge uh, labor force issue, and they, they're 10 years ahead of us. So take in mind that all these things are interconnected, and we're not going to get a there are no easy solutions and and to anna i, I do agree with you and Anna, but 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 my, my point is that giving i i'm speak as a former army officer uh, giving a lot of money to an armed force it does not solve the, the, the main the, the main issue at hand right now um we have to take it into account that again the competition between the armed forces and the rest of the uh, society is there. The, the, the rest of the, 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 the social structure also needs these, this per personnel. How do we solve that? Norway has a five, five and a half million, five million inhabitants. How do we find that trade-off between having a strong army, a strong standing army, and, and keeping up the rest of the social uh, welfare system that we need to? Yes. Uh, I want to ask a sort of follow-up to, uh, this was sort of riffed off of what uh, was talked about here, uh, especially with the dependency chains. Uh, if, uh, at least a uh, Christian, uh, if dependency is one of the key threats to uh, the Nordic countries or Europe Euro European countries in general, uh, what kind of trade policies, what kind of stance towards the EU and to the global markets uh, should European countries take, should uh, Nordic countries take uh, to solve the threat of codependency, which uh, is it only a codependency, codependency to uh, autocracies like Russia and China, or is dependency even within the European Union uh, an issue that we should solve, so to speak? Well, <coughs> I think mainly you, you must be dependent on someone, and you, you must have some friends, and it must accept that these friends probably will be possible to cooperate you with you in, in, in a difficult situation and then you must uh, ma make some uh, choices and I believe you, you must avoid the authoritarian regimes like you just mentioned and it's happening a lot now on the Eastern Front as we know it's happening relatively fast as well with China when NATO has defined it as a potential enemy and try to get out of the dependency on the critical uh, products and uh, and commodities and that means that i think europe could use an even stronger prior priority on which uh, who should do what in take a norwegian context we are relatively good at uh, metals processing industry but we are using more money on batteries and batteries I, we, we have no edge in batteries but we have an edge in processing industry we, we could do a lot of refining of uh, rare earth metals and magnesium and all these kind of metals that is all important but uh, eu do not have the power and but we have the whole production system but we have been dependent on, on china for too long but what we are doing most of is hydrogen and batteries 
So I think we are not really gone into the strategic thinking that are necessary, or especially on a European level. And my fear is that we are going from a high income society to the kind of high income, middle income society if we do not succeed with these things. And, I'm, and I believe that we are may doing, all the countries are doing too much of the same thing and we are competing with each other on all these batteries and this fit for 55 in a very, I feel, very, um, uh, in, in a way that we are more or less doing the same everybody and we, we are all we are all winners or all losers with that strategy and I think that is a big risk and it's not taking this di different uh, economic uh, value chains and the different economic traditions of the countries uh, is, is not taking them really seriously and uh, and, and that I fear that y you you could have no, I just pull it very far, but it could have a little more Soviet situation. Even, even everyone succeeds, or everyone fails, and, and that's a big risk. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I also want to add uh, in this mix of well different issues. Also, the fact that uh, people in a thriving society must be happy and harmonic. And Mahmoud, you said you you were talking about labor. Uh, that's a big issue right now. We lack labor uh, in Norway, in Europe, in the Nordic countries. And in Norway especially, we see young people, uh, they're not finishing school. They are not uh, taking part of the, the work life. Uh, they tend to go uh, on benefits. Uh, and that's a really, really um, serious development that we need to do something about. And uh, I think I'm really concerned actually about uh, young people, young generations, mental issues and mental health of as of today. Uh, I saw this article or survey in Financial Times showing that mental illnesses between young people have escalated after around 20, 2010. And what happened in 2010? Well, we got smartphones. We got on social media. That became our main platform of communication. We don't meet up face to face anymore. We communicate through digital uh, s telephones and computers, and that's kind of absurd, actually. And we, and we get, and we develop these mental illnesses that uh, that will throw us back. Uh, in and, and I'm really, uh, really concerned about that because we always have this phone within arm's reach, 24/7, and I think that is really destroying uh, the youth's mental health uh, today. In in our party, in the conservative party, where I and Mahmoud just went to a party conference, we tried uh, to to um, uh, to ban uh, mobile telephones uh, in schools, actually. Uh, but we didn't succeed, we didn't get uh, uh, an agreement on that. But uh, y you have some local regulations uh, in Norwegian schools and stuff, but I think it's time to act nationally when it comes to social media and young people and, and phones, because, well, the mental illnesses are escalating, and I think that also needs to be mentioned uh, in this debate about thriving societies and, and freedom, uh, yeah. Yes, and jumping onto the topic of thriving society and maybe even sovereignty, uh, a lot of the uh, mental health and other effects uh, can be seen quite clearly in the, the absolutely critical birthing crisis that's happening in Europe, uh, with birth rates plummeting everywhere to a, a frightening degree. Uh, what are really the, the core issues that uh, cause this, and if the only solution which uh, most of the time progressives and liberals offer uh, for the birthing crisis is only uh, completely unlimited mass immigration. Uh, uh, what are the pitfalls that happen or that, that we face for national security? Uh, 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 or, or, so this is the question, what are, what are the pitfalls that we face with this? What are the solutions to the birthing crisis? Is it first we solve the problems that will solve the birthing crisis? Is it the other way around? And uh, secondly, uh, uh, are we at danger of diluting Nordic democracy and Nordic culture uh, with mass immigration, with rise of, say, Islamic or uh, immigrant parties that we have seen bits and pieces of uh, in different places in Europe? 
I just uh, I, I could I could have a go on, on that point. You mentioned migrant parties. That was a cue to me. I, I, I proceeded that way. If you look at migrant parties, you look to Sweden. Uh, they 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 were essential in, in destroying the left uh, the left majority in Sweden, and that's why the the the, the conservative party and and the moderates and the, won the vote because the 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 the, um, the, the, the migrant parties when they rise at least they they compete with the socialists. And they don't get enough mandates, so so they just mess everything up. But that, that's one part of it. But I think this, if if we talk about birth rates in Europe, you have to take into consideration a few things. One is that urbanization in itself uh, reduces the the, the 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 birth rate. That's all over the world. Even in a country that I'm born, Iran. When people move to the cities, they have less kids over time. That, that, that's the way it is. Um, we could talk about fiscal policies or taxes. And, and monetary policy is a bit more difficult. You cannot, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, reduce the interest rate for, for families that have five kids. That's not going to work. It's going to be difficult. But you could use a fiscal policy to a certain degree. But we have to also take into account that we want uh, equality in our societies. We want people to, to be a part of the labor force. Uh, the, the question, that discussion that we have had back home in Norway is that if people start having kids a bit earlier than they do in Norway, I don't know what the average age is, I know you probably have better control than I do. Uh, <laughs> I'll I just say because, because 33. If you could reduce that by five years, people could have maybe have time to get, have another kid, maybe have three children instead of two. These are, these are the debates that we could have. But I think, that the, 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 I don't think a, mass migration is the solution because based on a discussion we had earlier today but we have to also take into account that we will need uh, skilled labor there are not enough experts in the world for all the uh, it technology changes that we're going to do industry 4.0 in itself will demand thousands of it experts we don't have that many hundreds of thousands we don't have that many in europe so we have to have skilled migration but we have to also have fiscal policies that 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 in a way, contribute to 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 a higher birth rate, but that's that's a complicated question, at least. Yes, and then Anton and then Anna, uh, very briefly, because we're running out of time. Unfortunately, uh, uh, how do we solve the birthing crisis? Why are we not thriving? Why is everyone depressed? And is immigration <laughs> diluting? On a positive note. <laughs> yes, and is immigration diluting Nordic democracy? <laughs> Thank you. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, as, as Rezan pointed out uh, earlier on, it's, it, it has to do with family policy as well. So j just to take uh, an example of a country that has succeeded. In 2010, Norway had 1.9 uh, children per uh, woman, and uh, now we have 1.4. In 2010, Hungary had 1.2, now they have 1.5. I think they have the most extensive incentive system so it functions if you really want to prioritize it. But we are not prioritizing. Actually, I think you're using more money on immigration than on fertility, just to put it uh, relatively bluntly. And, and that means that uh, it is possible, but you must d do the work. Everyone is talking about uh, you know, on, um, on defense, and they've suddenly increased it at 1% of GNP more or less all over. But you do nothing on the fertility rates is, is the core of the people in a way. And how you manage to uphold the tradition and culture and how you manage to have continuity on it. So, and then going to, uh, to immigration, I think, as in all uh, conservative thinking, it must be balanced. And if you're taking money on a short time, you must integrate before you can take more. Or you must do it, as it was said, it was an asylum, meaning that it was for a limited period. And then you go back, as you did during the Second World War and all these kind of aspects. So we must, in a way, re -intro, re restart the asylum thinking, and we must do the quantitative maths, I believe, and we must do the quantitative maths for, for the young people. And, and, the, and the most important people in the society is the ones who, who are between 25 and 40 because they are deciding everything. What they decide in these 15 years is defining their whole future. And that we must give them the right opportunity. And that's a failure of our society today. So uh, th that must be the main focus, uh, I believe. Thank you.
and Anna. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to quickly comment on the birth rate uh, issue, the question. And uh, uh, I'm in the, um, in the Social and Labour uh, Committee in the Norwegian in Parliament, and we address this issue all the time. And we went uh, to Japan uh, a couple of months ago, uh, where we discussed this a lot. In Japan, the birth rates are 1.4. Uh, in Norway as well, it's the same. Uh, Norway is though a bigger welfare state, you get more benefits for having kids, in Japan you don't. Uh, but the dis discussion between our committee and the Japanese politicians were, uh, well, I, I noticed that we were, we were so proud uh, about our welfare state and all the money that we give you when you have kids. Uh, and we tried like to impose uh, it on them. Uh, and they were like, oh, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we should uh, have something like that too. Uh, but then I sit there and I, I, I look at the numbers and it's the same. We have the same problem. It's 1.4 in Norway and it's 1.5 in Japan. So uh, all these benefits, all these economic uh, incentives, uh, are they really working? Uh, I'm not sure they are. Uh, our family minister now this week uh, just launched a huge package of new, int she introduced new welfare uh, goods and benefits for in, in hope of um, yeah getting Norwegians to to have more ki kids. And I'm not really sure if if throwing money on the problem is the solution. Uh, let's see, but uh, it's going to cost us. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes, and thank you to all of our panelists.